Okay, guys, this is go to present mode. This is your exam three review or health assessment. Okay, so some topics, potential topics. I, you know, before I had content on the exam, this is the topics that could be on your exam. So we have respiratory, the thorax and lungs, um, cardiac, circulatory or peripheral vascular. Um, and then of those three, um, there may be questions on fluid balance and labs and diagnostics. Some potential lab material may be on this exam because I think that is fair game to say that she um, will incorporate, because I've seen on the previous two that she'll incorporate like some questions on that. Um, so definitely make sure that you go through and review any of your lab skills from this past week, including INO, so intake and output, uh, O2 therapy and delivery, um, so like incentive spirometer, um, and the type of oxygen masks, all of that. Make sure you review that. I'm, I'm not really focusing on those too much um, because those are skills lab versus I'm kind of focusing in on the theory, uh, which are the first three, but um, also respiratory therapy and then wound care and dressing changes may be fair game for this exam as a heads up. Okay, so for respiratory, be sure you guys are, you know, have a sound understanding of the actual anatomy of the lungs. So right side, you have um, three lobes, right? So you have the superior lobe, middle lobe, and inferior lobe. And then the left side, you only have the two lobes. So you have the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. Uh, the left has that cardiac notch where the heart sits in as well. So that's right here. Um, and then know that, you know, your different segments of like your trachea, the, the main bronchus, the secondary uh, lower bronchus, and then the tertiary bronchus down below. And we'll go through like what you'll hear in each point too. So for assessment, we're gonna always inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate. So for inspection, you always wanna look at your patient. You wanna see if there's any labored breathing, perhaps. Um, you wanna ask them or even like take note of their positioning. Um, some things we become concerned about are either orth 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 orthopic or tripod position. So um, that is either like where they, they cannot lay down, they can't breathe when they're laying down. The tripod position is where they're kind of like hunched over, over their legs or over a table um, to get that oxygen in. Um, we want to look at AP diameter. So that's the anterior to posterior. So you're kind of going from front to back, looking at the uh, diameter differences between the front and the side mostly. So like, but that you're just kind of doing a walk around the patient where why it's called AP diameter. So the lateral view, so this side right here should be one to the front side or the back side two. If you start noticing that the, the side view, the lateral view is about the same width as the anterior, then that starts to become indicative of barrel chest. Um, so you want to palpate. So at the cost of vertebral angle, if you guys don't know where that is, it's down here. I, I forget what actual uh, thorax T something that it's at. Um, if you guys want to pop it in the chat, that'd be great. But I just know from like memory where to place my hands to test for that symmetry. And basically you place your hands like this on the back at that cost of vertebral angle. And you ask your patient, okay, take a deep breath in and out, and your hands are gonna go up like this symmetric, symmetrically. If one hand goes up, one hand just stays the same, um, in the same position, that is um, a possibility of uh, pneumothorax or another complication. I thought her say T9, T10, that's, that sounds right to me. Um, okay, so tactile for Midas. Um, so you can either do it flat hand or like sides of your hands down the back. I, I use the sides of my hands 
Um, and you just go down the back between the middle of the scapula all the way down and you ask your patient to say 99, 99, 99, 99, right? Um, so percussion, know the difference between resonance and dullness and what is a normal finding with the lungs and what is abnormal. Um, so resonance is the normal finding with percussing for lungs. Um, dullness would be indicative of consolidation or some other issue. Um, so auscultation on a normal average sized person, you're gonna do six sites anteriorly and then eight sites posteriorly and two laterally, so two on each side. Um, vital signs for SpO2, we want it to always be above 95%, unless, I shouldn't say always, unless we have a patient that has COPD, um, it might be a baseline for them to be in the high 80s. And you want to always ask your patient if you don't have it, like if they're new to the facility, um, you want to ask them, is this a baseline? Is this normal? Um, oxygen saturation for you um, and then note that in your documentation because that'll be important to know. Um, we never want to give too much oxygen to uh, patients with COPD. We talked about this in lab earlier. Basically, it would be a form of oxygen toxicity and it would cause them to like hypoventilate because they would not want to, they, they're having an issue. They're used to that the CO2 level is being higher. Um, so, respiratory rate should be between 12 and 20. Okay, so normal breath sounds. So, for normal breath sounds, we have bronchial, bronchial vesicular, and then vesicular. And um, it's important to know, you know, like, it's going to be louder up here on your inspiration, and then because it's traveling further, the expiration will be softer. And then um, going down bronchofascicular and just knowing like where at each level um, your breath sounds are louder on inspiration and expiration are an important thing to know. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about tracheal. We never talked about tracheal breath sounds too much. It was more the three, the bronchial, bronchial, vesicular, and vesicular. Okay, so abnormal breath sounds. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Molly, back on that other slide. I get a little, I got confused on that just from watching other videos too, because mm -hmm. is it is it that bronchial is the same as tracheal? because it seems like the only place that you can hear bronchial is at the trachea. I know that bronchial has I, to do with sound through the bronchus, so I get yeah, that. Yeah, I, I don't know, it's a good question. I just wouldn't get hung up on it because again, the only things that like I recall them like focusing on were the bronchial, bronchiovesicular, and the vesicular. And I mean, even here in this diagram, this says bronchial and then in parentheses tracheal. I grab these two components from different things. Yeah. Um, and this one here, the tracheal is saying like the expiratory and inspiratory is they're equal. Um, so it's a little confusing to me. Obviously, it's a different thing, a different yeah. area that's not noted here on this image. But again, yeah. In health assessment, they don't really go too big into the tracheal. They just focus on those three. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so abnormal breath sounds. So these are called adventive sounds, right? And we have crackles. Um, they could be known as rails as well. And in this um, chart here, I kind of like added my extra notes off to the side. So crackles, they can be fine, but they can also be coarse crackles. Um, and in addition to what it says on the chart here, um, it could be indicative of infection or CHF, so congestive heart failure, right? That's a big thing we usually hear um, with both left and right-sided. Uh, you'll hear it with left-sided first, and then eventually right-sided causes left-sided heart failure anyways, so it can be with both. Um, bronchi, um, which is sonorous wheeze, and that can be heard over the trachea and the bronchi region. Um, this is usually with bronchitis or pneumonia. 
wheezes um, are more like have a more musical quality. Um, they're higher pitched than Ronkai, and that's more with like asthma patients, COPD. Um, pleural friction rub is usually um, with pleuritis or pneumonia. That one they don't usually focus too much on. It's usually like either the wheezes or the crackles that I feel like were important ones that I remember from health assessment. Um, but if you guys want to have this as like any of like the, the charts I've put up, feel free to take a screenshot of if you want to have them as reference for the HESI. Um, that's a lot of the reason why I'm covering certain things is because I know that they will come up on HESI. So you're welcome to take a screenshot of certain charts if you'd like. Okay. I wanted to go over this because when I first started, this confused me, the difference between a pneumothorax and atelectasis. So last week we talked about the tracheal shift versus the tracheal pull, and this is a really great example of the two differences with the um, with a pneumothorax is going to be uh, shifted to the unaffected side, right? But with atelectasis, atelectasis, it's pulled to the same side. The difference between the two is that atelectasis is like a collapse of the little air air filled sacs, the alveoli that are at that tertiary area, the segmental area at the bottom where you hear your vesicular breath sounds. Um, and then a pneumothorax is a complete collapse of the lung. Okay. So respiratory complications, these are acute complications, and I just added a few in here that might be fair game for your exam. So pneumonia can be community or hospital acquired. Um, there's different types of pneumonia too. It can also be ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, it's confirmed with sputum cultures and other diagnostics such as a chest x-ray. With asthma, they're gonna be using those accessory muscles to breathe. They're gonna have the constriction of the airway. You're gonna hear wheezes or strider. Um, they will need a potent bronchodilator when they're having a, like an acute asthma attack. Um, so a short acting uh, beta two agonist. And then, um, and that's like probably what happened with like a child, right? Because if they know that they have asthma, then they, they get the patient education and they're sent home with their medications that they use regularly, which would include like LABAs, which are the long acting beta 2 agonists. Um, and they're both bronchodilators. And there's a bunch of different medications too that you guys may have been introduced to when you went through Pathopharm. Um, I know that you guys did that prior to the program, right? With the ABSN. Yeah, cool. Okay, so pulmonary embolism is a clot that travels to the lungs and blocks adequate gas exchange. Um, the main cause of pulmonary embolism is a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. Um, the three um, signs that there is a pulmonary embolism that they usually like focus on and talk about are dyspnea, chest pain, and impending doom. And it like hits them like sudden and severe that chest pain too. Any questions so far? Doing okay? Okay, respiratory complications continue. So we have COPD, which is uh, a chronic condition. There are two main types of COPD. I really found this <laughs> um, chart really helpful. I like charts and like, um, you know, comparing and contrasting different things. This was really helpful to me when I learned the two primary types of COPD. So we have the blue bloaters and the pink buffers. So emphysema and chronic bronchitis, right? <clears throat> um, chronic, bronchi chronic bronchitis is an air airway flow problem. They, use, they tend to be cyanotic. Um, they're both going to have have hypoxia, I believe. Um, the emphysema patients will have CO2 retention. Um, they won't really have that cyanosis. Um, you're going to have the clubbing more with 
chronic bronchitis. The big takeaways for this exam, is, I would remember, are clubbing with the chronic bronchitis. The barrel chest happens with, with emphysema more so. Um, chronic bronchitis is going to have, uh, they're going to be more overweight and they're going to be the ones that tend to go into heart failure. And, oh, emphysema patients definitely have that pursed lip breathing as well. That's like a, a good characteristic to differentiate. Yeah, I would say that those are the big ones to know. Both are going to have exertional dyspnea. If you guys don't know what dyspnea is, that's just shortness of breath. Um, and then you can see the emphysema patient is in that, that tripod position, right? Where they're, they're hunched over, they're kind of leaning on their legs to get the air in. And trying to breathe off the CO2 with the pursed lip breathing. Okay. So other potential complications. Um, so other abnormal breathing patterns may include that she might put on there. Uh, chain stokes. Kussmaul's breathing, so that happens with di diabetic ketoacidosis, right? Um, ataxic breathing and sleep apnea. Um, other potential respiratory complications could include inhalation injuries, so like inhaling too much smoke in a fire, um, hemothorax, which, which is basically blood accumulating around the lung. Um, ours is um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then respiratory failure. Some nursing and priorities and interventions with respiratory. Um, ABCs are always a priority, right? It always comes back to that. So we wanna monitor vital, vital signs very carefully. Um, you may delegate certain tasks like vital signs to the CNAs, but again, it always comes back to the RN to be making sure that everything is looking all right, um, and if it's not, they need to go on NSS. Uh, oxygen needs, um, you need an MD order for oxygen, but you can administer or make changes before getting that order. So if a patient's vital signs are, uh, their SpO2 starts to plummet and they already are on oxygen or they're not on oxygen, you can manipulate that however you see fit. Um, there's different um, oxygen levels for different um, methods of getting oxygen into them, whether it's mask or nasal cannula. Uh, patient SpO2, oh yeah, I just said that. Um, and those are, these are the different types of O2 delivery. So there's a high, high and low flow nasal cannulas or simple mask, venturi mask and non rebreathers. Um, I remember health assessment was big on the different respiratory therapies and the oxygen delivery types. Um, I didn't get to see too much of the different um, oxygen delivery types in med surgery. It was mostly nasal cannula that I saw. Uh, recovery and prevention. So when people on med surgery, they're recovering from surgery most of the time. You're going to have to teach them to do deep breathing and cough exercises to make sure that those alveoli don't collapse and they don't get the atelectasis. So either using an incentive spirometer or teaching them deep breathing and coughing exercises is critical. It's really important. Um, other types of patient education would include their medications that they may be given. So every time you go in and you're doing, you know, your, all your patient rights and then you're, you're giving the medication, you also want to be, you know, telling the patient, I'm giving you this, it's for this. You want to explain to them what it's being, what it's treating, basically. Um, you want to do patient education on follow-up, and that's usually done during discharge. Uh, you may need a trach set up at the bedside if necessary, if as prevention, um, depending on the patient. Okay, so cardiac. Again, I, I talked about this last week, but if you guys don't know the flow of blood through the body, through the heart, 
be solid on this because that is like huge in health assessment is no because you can't start to make sense of the disease processes unless you know this. Um, if you guys hadn't done that trace the blood thing in physiology through the body and through the heart, I would do that. Like, you know what I'm talking about where you do like a drop of blood and you trace it like, you know, what I'm talking about anyone. No, <laughs> um, no, for sure. The blood flow. There's lower pressure coming from the lower extremities with the valves that are returning blood to the heart. Um, and then there's higher pressures, right, coming from the left side out of the heart. Okay, cardiac assessment. So for auscultation, the mnemonic ape to man, it was always really helpful for me. So you have aortic pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and mitral. Um, you want to assess for any murmurs or extra heart sounds. Once you go from ape to man, you're just going to flip to the bell, right? Because we always listen with the bell for any extra heart sounds or murmurs, and you would just go back in the reverse direction through those points. Um, objective data that you could also collect for cardiac assessment would be thrills or heaves. Those are both um, palpable um, findings. So a thrill uh, is like a purr like sensation that you'll feel like a cat purring. A heave is literally like it's going to heave out of the chest. The heart is heaving. Um, Bruies, we listen for bruises primarily. There are some common spots we would listen to them are the carotid arteries. And then after the bifurcation of the aorta, we have the iliac arteries that they, you can listen for breweries as well. Um, you want to assess for possible GBD or edema if there's suspected heart failure. Um, some subjective data we can gather from the patient is, is, has there been any significant weight gain? If they come in and they're like, you know, my shoes aren't fitting quite right, my feet seem swollen, and I've had this, like, pretty big weight gain in the last week, okay, you're going to think, heart failure, cardiac, and you start diving into more questions surrounding that. Um, if they come in and they, they, they have a complaint of chest pain, this will happen a lot in the ED. If someone comes in with chest pain, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to slap that EKG on them. That's going to be the first priority. Then you're going to get labs and other diagnostics, CT, all of that. Um, but the very first thing, and this is a question that comes up a lot in HESIs, is what you will do first when they come in with chest pain. It's always EKG. Um, vitals, heart rate 60 to 100. You guys know that at this point. Uh, blood pressure, the normal is around 120 over 80. And also the normal can be different for each patient depending on what state of health they're in. Okay, normal heart sounds. So S1 and S2 are the normal heart sounds. S1 is loudest at the tricuspid and mitral valves because that is those valves closing, right? It's the AV valves that are closing on S1. And that's gonna be loudest at those points that you're listening, right? S1 and S2 are equal at herbs point. And then by contrast, S2 is loudest at the aortic and pulmonic because which valves are closing? The semilunar valves. So the semilunar valves are going to be heard best up top because they're higher on the heart, right? They're above, and then the, the other valves are with between the atria and the ventricle, right? Um, they sound like lub dub. That never really made sense to me. They don't sound like lub dub to me. <laughs> um, they just sound like bump, 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 bump. <laughs> not lub dub, uh, but. Lub is S1, dub is S2. S1 is right before the heart contracts, and then S2 is right before the heart relaxes. So systole and diastole, right? Abnormal heart sound. So I'm just going to touch on this. She did say, she gave me feedback uh, yesterday saying that don't worry about this, you guys. S3 and S4 will not be on the exam, but I do want to touch on it because I can almost guarantee it's going to be on your HESI. Um, the HESI definitely 
likes to um, pull these S3, S4 heart sound questions in. So S3 is the ventricular gallop. It happens right after S2, the closure of the semilunar valves. It's not as serious um, as S4, but it can be a normal finding in young children, athletes, and pregnant women. Um, it still needs a follow-up no matter what though. S4 is the atrial gallop, and this is more serious. Uh, it happens right before the S1, the closure of the AV valves. It's a sign of possible aortic stenosis, which is a medical emergency, or MI, which is a medical emergency. You guys know what MI is, right? Myocardial infarction. Um, CHF, it could be an indicator of CHF as well. Um, both of them can be an indicator of CHF um, and more. Heart murmurs, um, their qualities may be rasping, whooshing, or blowing sounds. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Good. Cardiac complications continued so acute. We have myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. We have heart dysrhythmias. There's a bunch of different heart dysrhythmias. Um, but maybe for this, maybe no atrial fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can be chronic in some cases. Um, there's an increased risk of stroke. Uh, it's not as serious as ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is a life-threatening dysrhythmia. You need to make an immediate correction. Uh, acute coronary syndrome is, this can happen with a heart attack, MI. And this is more of like a state that the vessel is in, whether it's spasming. So that would be like a calcium channel, channel issue um, if there's coronary uh, vessel spasms, or it can be um, a clot or some sort of blockage. And it would be hypoxia to that cardiac tissue, right? Do you guys know what hypoxia is? Yes, okay. Again, please speak up if I'm like going too fast and, or if you, it's just way over your heads at this point, that is perfectly fine to speak up because if you're feeling this way, I guarantee there's more than one of you. And I will be glad to explain any of these terms that I'm using if they have not been introduced to you yet, but I think that they have, um, I just wanna be sure. Okay. so. Pericarditis and myocarditis. Um, these, this is inflammation. It's most commonly caused by a virus, either um, around the pericardium or the myocardium, or through the myocardium. So the myocardium is the heart muscle. The pericardium is the sac around the muscle. Uh, myocardium is a more severe. Myocarditis is a more severe problem. Um, it's a severe risk for heart failure and sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> Um, cardiac complications continue. So heart disease, the most, which is chronic, uh, the most common form of heart disease is coronary artery disease. Um, just a little pathogenesis on it. So you're going to get those atherosclerotic plaques from foam, cell, foam cells that come in. They phagocytize the LDLs, the bad um, cholesterol, right? They're going to phagocytize those and then fatty plaques are gonna be left behind in the vessels, kind of building up um, throughout the vessel happening in the coronary artery. And then damage happens to these vessels when those plaques rupture and there's endothelial damage. And then you're gonna have um, clotting and blockages within those arteries. So that's just like the pathogenesis of that. Myocardial infarction, again, that's a heart attack and damage to cardi cardiomyocytes. Um, it's Indi indicated by troponin levels and other diagnostics. Um, it's a major, MI is a major threat of coronary artery disease. Did I say that backwards? It's the other way around. <laughs> That's what I meant. Um, and then we also have valvular heart disease, but I don't think she's going into those yet, is she? That, that usually comes in 
I want to say even further past med surge, just more like ICU. No, med surge, they start focusing on the valve. Did she talk about the different valve heart diseases yet? No. Okay. Yeah, that's why I didn't put anything. I was like, I'll put that there just in case and talk about it if I need to, but. Okay, heart failure. I do know that even when I was in health assessment, we, we focus a lot on heart failure. Um, this is a chronic condition um, and there's no reversing heart failure. Once you are diagnosed with heart failure, you have heart failure. Um, with our patients, we wanna always do strict INOs. Uh, so that's intake and output, right? So we wanna monitor very carefully how much fluids they're taking in and how much they're putting out. We usually monitor that with urine. Um, patient education for heart failure. We want to focus on smoking cessation, a DASH diet, um, exercise, and medications. For meds, we primarily will, you'll see a lot of this in med surge that we'll be giving a lot of Lasix to our patients. Uh, which is furosemide also, so it can be termed as either. Um, it's just generic versus brand name. And that's going to pull the fluid off, right? That's what diuretics are doing. They're pulling the fluid off. Other meds that treat heart failure are beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers end in LOL, LOL. ACE inhibitors end in PRIL, P-R-I-L. Um, this is also a really another good chart comparison between left sided and right sided heart failure. I think it's really important to know the differences between the two. Again, it goes back to understanding the flow of blood through the heart to understand um, how each side is getting affected. I think someone in lab earlier, you know, said the opposite side and that's again where everyone's first train of thought always goes but you have to think of it as a backing up problem so left-sided l think ll left lung it's going to be a lung issue so they're going to get that pulmonary edema um they're going to have the crackles that you're hearing in the lungs right um they're going to have all of these signs and symptoms Right-sided is going to be backing up to the rest of the body. So they're going to have the edema in the lower extremities. They're going to have that JVD. For JVD, we always want to assess that at like a 30 to 45 degree angle and have them turn to the side. You guys know this from practicing your head to toe assessments already. Um, they're going to have weight gain because they're retaining all those fluids and they're going to have that third spacing edema down here. They may have ascites. Do you guys know what ascites is? I don't think that's all, always the case, but it's just one extra thing that they could potentially have. Ascites is that third spacing edema in the abdomen. So the, the uh, interstitial fluid, it's moving out and um, they're having that third spacing there. And there's different tests that you can do for it. You can watch videos on it too to show you how you would test for ascites. Okay, peripheral vascular, this is another really great diagram um, showing the difference between venous stasis and arterial insufficiency. So is there edema present or is there no edema present? Um, it's showing the different types of wounds with each, um, showing the signs with each, signs and symptoms of each. I like this diagram a lot, that's a really good one. Um, so peripheral vascular disease is a chronic circulatory disorder affecting the peripheries. There's narrowing, blockages, and more that contribute to poor perfusion and hypoxia. Venous stasis is, right here, is a valve problem. So the valves in the lower extremities are having a hard time pumping that blood back up to the heart, so it's pooling down below. Um, arterial insufficiency is a problem with the arteries perfusing the extremities, either going through the arteries themselves or just like getting to the extremities and um, they're having poor perfusion of the extremities because of that. Okay, fluid balance. So 
at its basic level, we should know hypervolemic and hypovolemic for fluid balance. Hypervolemic is fluid overload. This happens a lot with heart failure, kidney failure, or liver failure. Um, it's a preload afterload problem. There's going to be that edema, third spacing of the extremities. You're going to check for JVD with fluid overload, hypervolemia. Um, you're going to ask about shortness of breath or look at possibly inspect and see how they're breathing too. Um, you're going to auscultate in here if there's any crackles within the lungs, which crackles are indicative of fluid buildup in the lungs. That's what you're hearing is when they breathe in and out, you're hearing like the bubbling, the popping of the fluid that's in there. Um, we need to diurese these patients, but it's always really important to know that you do not want to diurese patients too quickly because it will plummet the blood pressure. Their blood pressure will drop really low if you do it too fast. You want to always, when you're diuresing patients, so you're giving them the Lasix or any other diuretic, you always want to um, carefully monitor their vitals. Hypovolemia is fluid loss. So some common things that this can happen with are hemorrhage, vomiting, or excessive diarrhea, such as like C. diff. Um, you want to also be doing careful monitoring of vitals. We worry more about the diarrhea with pediatric patients uh, because they're much smaller and a fluid loss with a pediatric patient can do can be way more serious and more of a medical emergency compared to like what it's doing to an adult patient just because of size differences. Um, and a big one you'll see with uh, L&D, like um, maternity patients is the hemorrhages, right? So that's hypovolemic fluid loss. You wanna be carefully monitoring those vitals again. You wanna bring the blood pressure up if their blood pressure is plummeting because they're losing too much uh, fluid loss, whether it's blood, vomit, diarrhea, you want to be giving them a bolus of something and then giving them a continuous um, IV flow of probably normal saline is usually what they use, the 0.9%. The um, and then you want to monitor their fluids and electrolyte imbalances carefully when you are restoring fluids to them because you don't want to have those fluid shifts and electrolyte imbalances as well on top of like the fluid loss and fluid replenishment problems. By bolus, do you just mean like a thousand ml of like LR or NS? Um, yeah, it wouldn't be on like a gravity. I don't think it would set. be a th yeah. It's definitely like a bolus is set to like a fast, like over like thirty minutes. Like it's it's a bolus. Um, it'll it'll go into them quickly. Okay, makes sense. It might even be faster than that, depending on the orders. Okay, so strict. INOs for fluid balance, so intake and output, right? Um, careful documentation of what the patient has taken in by mouth. So it could either be mouth, IV, nasogastric tube, PEG tube, or OG tube. Um, any of those are like routes into the body to getting fluids in. So you want to be monitoring carefully and documenting carefully. I write, but documenting <laughs> carefully how much is going in and how much is going out. Typically we measure in urine, like we look at the urine um, of what's coming out of them. Uh, and then you want to continue to monitor for risk of hyperhypovolemia. Um, I think it's probably important to know these um, conversion, not conversions, but equivalents. One mil equals one cc, which also equals 30 ounces. I hope there's not much more math, but I really don't know what else she would put on. There is with like, when you get to pediatrics, like there's math that becomes a lot more important on um, fluid maintenance, but that's usually focusing on pediatrics. So I don't think she'll have that. Do you think there might be questions like 35 ml, like the people who are above 70 kilograms? I don't know. Like, what, what do you guys remember what that That's was? That's fluid maintenance. Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah. So that's, that's usually exactly with pediatric. Gonna... That's usually with pediatric patients. Um, did she go over that with you guys? I know oh, yeah. any yeah. adult that was like 70 kilograms or higher, all you do, I think, is like multiply by 35. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I was. Again, anything she goes over is fair game. Okay. Yeah. Um, usually fluid maintenance becomes more of like a thing that you focus in with pediatric patients, because again, like I said, it can be more of a dangerous situation because they're tinier. Um, but if she went over it, I mean, it's, it's fair game. Okay. Practice questions. Does anybody have any questions before we start practice questions? Did that seem like it like covered like the bulk of what you <laughs> I hope? Cool. Okay. Practice questions. All right. So presence of overdescended and non functional alve alveoli is a condition called. You guys want to answer in the chat? Got one answer so far. Two. Okay, you guys know your stuff. Okay, good job. Emphysema. So an overdescended and non functional alveoli is a condition called emphysema. Atelectasis is the collapse of part or the whole lung. Um, I think that's why it confused me the most because. Atelectasis is defined as that, but just know that atelectasis is usually talking about the exact um, and that's why it confused me when I first started learning it early on between the pneumothorax and atelectasis. Um, but yeah, it's it's usually like the partial collapse. And pima is the presence of pus in the lung, and you'll get that crepitation, right? She talked about that. So it's like almost like. Um, I'm trying to think of how they described it to us. You'll be able to palpate it and it's almost like you'll feel air bubbles under the skin with empyema. I don't know if I say it right. Uh, okay, really so quick, Natalie, uh, I, mm -hmm. um, to go back to the last, the, the slide before that, I think there was a typo. It should be one ounce equals 30 milliliters. Correct? <laughs> um yes sorry it's You're okay right. i was just like all of a sudden i'm like holy that's a lot of freaking ounces no okay yes anyway. no sorry. you're right sorry about that i i can't even put that because yeah i have like a little beaker and i've been allowed like for a long time i can't believe that You're totally right <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. You win. It's fine. We all know what the real one was. You're good. We appreciate that you're even doing this. So no worries. Okay. We answered that one. Okay. The accumulation of fluids in the pleural space is called A, pleural effusion, B, chemothorax, C, hydrothorax, D, pyothorax. Yeah, nice job. In an emergency room, nurse is assessing a female client who ooh, who has sustained a blunt injury to the chest wall. Which of these signs would indicate the presence of pneumothorax in this client? A, a low respiratory. B, diminished breath sounds. C, the presence of a barrel chest. D, a sucking sound at the site of injury. Good job, guys. So diminished breath sounds. The client has a stained blunt or a closed chest injury. So there hasn't been like the puncture through the chest wall. Symptoms of a closed pneumothorax are shortness of breath and chest pain. A larger pneumothorax may cause tachypnea 
cyanosis, diminished stress sounds, and subcutaneous emphysema. Hyperresonance also may occur on the affected side. A sucking sound at the site of an injury would be noted with an open chest injury. That's where chest tubes and all that will come in. Okay, so a patient has been, been diagnosed with right-sided heart failure and is confused about return of deoxygenated blood from the tissue. To clarify the confusion, which chamber of the heart receives blood from the systemic circulation? A, left atrium, B, right atrium, C, B, uh, right ventricle, D, left ventricle. are so smart. Yeah, right atrium. The right atrium is a thin walled structure that receives deoxygenated blood from all the peripher periphery by way of the superior and inferior vena cava and from the heart also by way of the coronary sinus. Okay, it is important that the nurse be knowledgeable about cardiac output in order to A, evaluate blood flow to peripheral tissues, B, determine the electrical activity of the myocardium, C, provide information on the immediate need for oxygen, or D, implement nutritional changes. Yep, you're going to evaluate blood flow to the periphery. Uh, blood flow to tissues is measured clinically as the cardiac output and assists to predict tissue perfusion. Electrical activity is something completely different and is evaluated with more, more effectively by EKG. While the cardiac output is important to for perfusion and oxygenation of tissues, the oxygen saturation would provide more valuable information. Nutritional changes would be targeted to sodium and would depend on symptoms of the disease. Okay, the nurse is caring for a client with heart failure. On assessment, the nurse notes that the client is dys dyspneic and crackles are audible on auscultation. What additional signs would the nurse expect to note in this client if excess fluid volume is present? So A, weight loss. B, flat neck and hand veins. C, an increase in blood pressure. D, decreased central venous pressure. Yeah. You guys know this stuff. You're going to do so good. Yep, an increase in blood pressure. So a fluid volume excess is also known as overhydration or fluid overload and a fluid intake or fluid retention exceeds the fluid needs of the body. Assessment findings associated with fluid overload or fluid include cough, dyspnea, crackles, tachypnea, tachycardia, elevated blood pressure, a bounding pulse, elevated central venous pressure, weight gain, um, edema, neck and hand, level of consciousness, and decreased hematocrit because it's dilution, right? There's too much fluid in the body. Those red blood cells are all becoming hemodiluted. The remaining options identify signs noted in flu fluid volume deficit, so hypovolemia. And that is it. So I will stop the I guess I gotta stop sharing first. Hopefully that